All right. I love hearing those stories about end users are making huge progress in short amount of time. Next up, um, this we're going to shift into some back into some kind of architectural discussions. Event processing and stream processing have become part of a, a huge part of the modern architectures that we're building. If you remember the, the good doctor, David Sire, illustrating some of this in his talk earlier today. So within that, Apache Kafka has become one of those versatile tools in the developer and data engineer tool belt. Um, and so I'm delighted to invite uh, CTO and co-creator of Apache Kafka, CTO of Confluent and co-creator of Apache Kafka, here to the stage, Neha Nekere. Thank you. Oh, w what about my open source selfie? Well, never mind. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Spring One. I hope you're having a wonderful conference. Um, today, I'm going to talk about something that I'm incredibly excited about. You know, this is something I think is missing from a lot of applications we build today. I think this is also something that Kafka has really enabled the vision for. I'm going to talk about events and how event-driven microservices are on the rise. I'll also share some practical applications that I've seen it enable in the industry. But first off, you know, here's why this matters, right? James tweeted yesterday about a survey of more than 300 companies where it said that roughly 50% of all applications communicate you know, using Apache Kafka. Those are the services that are likely event-driven microservices. So before I dive in further beyond that, can I get a quick show of hands of people who've heard of and use Apache Kafka? Well, that's about 85 to 90%. So I'll skip the what is Kafka part. And for those of you who thought I was talking about Franz Kafka, well, now is the time to take a quick nap and come back. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know about Franz Kafka, I think you're the lucky ones. <laughs> OK, so um, you know, reasoning from first principles, what are digital businesses? You know, digital business is largely modeled in software and data unlike people and processes. So in that sense, you know, digital business is really a series of events and responses to those events. So what are some examples? When a credit card transaction happens, some software triggers it processing. When you request a ride, some software triggers it scheduling. When this happens, do that is a very natural form of thinking of what a digital business is. So events that cause actions in a business are really everywhere. So in that sense, a digital business can't just be modeled as static tables of state. You need that, but you also need to model the dynamics of how that state changes, the what happened part. And that's the reason why events are everywhere in a digital business. So if events are everywhere, what is an event? You know, it's the simplest thing you could imagine. It's something that happened, an immutable record of something that occurred. What are some examples? Well, if you're like me, you might understand retail. You keep ordering things online or go to stores. The events then at the heart of the operations of a retail business are sales of things and shipments of products. And the back end of retail is really just placing new orders. But in addition to placing those orders, it's doing many other important things. It's repricing products. Right? It's moving products from distribution centers to stores. It's raising an alert when there's some kind of slowdown in the whole supply chain. You can think of all those things as kind of stream processing that's happening in response to the core events, sales and shipments, that really form the foundation of a retail business. And events don't just occur in retail. As you can imagine, they occur everywhere else, too. Here are some examples, right? A sale, an invoice, a trade, some aspect of a customer experience. These are all events. But the world of events is actually much larger than this, and this is why they're so powerful. Events also capture changes in your application state. So 
if your application stores your state in a database, in a row in a database, if you change that row, then that's an event. So going from old value to new value, a change in state is kind of a very fundamental thing for application development in an event-driven world. That's the idea that is powering application paradigms like event sourcing and CQRS, where you keep an event stream around. You decouple the reads from the writes. You scale them independently. Not only that, you can recreate the application stale. You know, in a downstream application or after that application fails and comes back. The same notion that powers event sourcing is also fundamental to database replication and distributed systems, where you have this change lock of events that can take a table, turn it into a stream, and replicate it downstream in a different system. In fact, the database commit log is essentially a series of change events to the database. And that's also what the database uses to recreate itself, to create a replica of itself. So this change log and this stream table duality is really at the heart of Kafka's design. It allows you to do stream processing on a source of truth event log. You can look at this picture. You can replace the left side of the picture and replace the database with your application. You can replace the right side of this picture with pretty much anything else. It could be an Elastic Index, a Cassandra store, or just your application cache. That's how generalizable this idea is of event-driven microservices on top of Apache Kafka. So if you take a step back and think about this, events are also the most natural form in which data occurs. And the only reason why we waited and we wait until data lands in our data stores because the technology so far has trained us to think of data as a static store rather than as a continuously flowing stream of information. So the powerful idea I want to share here is that you can represent all your data as events. It could be events could be application information. It could be logs. It could be communication between your microservices. It could be change logs from your databases. This is what makes stream processing so powerful, is the idea that you can take data that occurs in all these different parts of your company and have a way of responding to them, have a way of transforming them. And that's what forms the foundation of event-driven applications. This is why events are so fundamental. They're really a universal language for continuously evolving data. So if events are so powerful, you know, uh, where are they? Events really haven't had a proper home in infrastructure. They don't occur in relational databases in any real way. They don't occur in RPC systems in any real way. They're implicit. They're somewhere in your code. They're hidden. You have to go look for them. But you often don't see an object that's named an event. This is in part what we're trying to solve with Kafka, is give events a real home within a business. But if you try to answer this question, like, why are events hidden? You know, what does our infrastructure even give us today? It gives us these things. There have been tables. There are caches. There are applications. You have all these places where you can go store your state in. In fact, much of the logic in a database exists, so you think that the data isn't changing. But it really is underneath the covers. So the world of events and explicit representation of change has been missing. So if you were to make events more explicit, you really need to think about how they occur. Events take two forms. You know, they occur as triggers, you know, something that makes an application go do some work. So if I send a request to your HTTP service, it goes and does some work and sends me back a response, that's essentially a trigger. But events also act as data. So if you keep an event stream around like you can in Apache Kafka, you can actually process things on it. You can compute things. It could be aggregates. It could be just transformations. Or it could be just that you store it in a downstream system in real time. So as an example, you know, let's say I have my retail application. On the left, it posts some sales events that really carries this who bought what information. 
Let's see how I have another microservice that takes those events, it joins it with the inventory table, and then it sends updated inventory counts as another stream. And finally, I have my last microservice. It reads the updated inventory count stream. And if that count drops below a certain level, it triggers you know, reordering. So if you look at this picture, you know, these could be your Spring applications, but these are really event-driven microservices. They consume a feed of events, and they produce a feed of events. And that's pretty much it. Here, events are simply acting as triggers. But event streams also take another form, which is data pipelines. You know, let's say I'm working on the same sale event stream, but now I'm trying to glean customer buying preferences from this who bought what event stream. And let's say I take the change log from my customer database, and I join these two things together to create a unified 360, customer 360-degree profile. And then I store it downstream in some kind of a Cassandra data store, and I just keep doing that. But notice in this example, this looks much less like a microservices, much more like a data transformation pipeline, like an ETL pipeline. But if you take a step back and think about it, both of these are equivalent. In both cases, I'm taking event streams, I'm joining with possible tables of data to create new streams of events. The fact that you can put together both data inside your applications and data inside your data systems together is what makes event-driven architecture so powerful. So the question is, well, where does the stream processing happen, and where do all these streams live? Well, streams live in a streaming platform. This is our vision for how modern digital businesses would be built, is that you have a central place where you can collect these streams, no matter where they occur, whether they're in microservices, different systems, you know, whether they're originating in your application logs, and really have a central way of responding to events, of transforming them, of having to do all this in real time. But the fundamental thing also is, and this is why Kafka is so popular and event-driven microservices is an upcoming trend, is that this is a very different way of thinking about communication in your business. You know, instead of me having to know everyone I need to go talk to, I just say, what happened in my part of the business? And then whichever applications people that need to subscribe to it, they merely tap into the streaming platform, consume those events, and enable their applications. This scales so much better. You know, you can decouple not only applications, you can decouple people, and it really, in some sense, turns the communication in your company inside out. You know, events used to be on the sidelines of a business. You know, this is not a new concept. It has been around for decades, but now they're pushed to being front and center. And the reason for that is not just that it's a good idea and it decouples your microservices and real time is kind of a good thing. It's because the world has changed pretty significantly and there are these pretty overarching trends that are driving digital businesses, causing events to be front and center. Whether it is move to you know, uh, microservices, it's the Internet of Things, it's the dominance of mobile, emergence of public cloud, rise of machine learning, all of these are part of the same Uber trend, which is digitization of business. This, more than everything, is driving the move to event-driven architectures and streaming platforms. And this is happening in the real world. You know, Audi's Connected Car Initiative is a great example of transforming a traditional industry like automotive to an event-driven business. They have this vision of being able to collect data from hundreds of sensors on the car's onboard processors and lean on this streaming backbone powered by Apache Kafka to be able to send it across different parts of their businesses to power all sorts of things, from alerting drivers in real time about obstacles in the road, to enabling faster traffic systems across Germany, to even issuing you know, repairs uh, and, and reducing costs from repairs, all in all in real time. Not only is it happening in the automotive industry, but the banking industry is really transforming rapidly. 
Event-driven banking is a pretty big overarching trend. You know, Royal Bank of Canada, they started with uh, you know, a simple project to move away from mainframes, but now they've put in a streaming platform to power their move to microservices and spring applications that rely on a streaming backbone. And this has really done a bunch of things for the bank, including reducing anomaly detection time from weeks to seconds and much more. So I want to leave you with the end state. You know, why would you do this? And, and what does an event-driven enterprise even look like? The possibilities are actually immense. In this state, everything happening in your business is an event. It's available instantly to all the applications in the company that need to process it. You have the ability to query data and respond to it as it arrives versus when it is too late. And all this is possible by also simplifying your data architecture, by deploying a single platform that replaces your mesh of different ETL tools by relying on this central streaming platform. You know, why does this matter here? It's because you know, Spring and Kafka go really well together. If you really wanted to adopt this event-driven microservices paradigm, there are a few projects that you can leverage. You know, developers can take advantage of these Spring frameworks that integrate Kafka in the framework itself, including Spring Cloud Stream, Spring Kafka. Not only that, if you're struggling to deploy Apache Kafka, we're collaborating closely with Pivotal to enable you know, this ability to deploy Kafka more easily on the Pivotal container service using the Confluent operator. This is really meant to automate provisioning of Kafka pods in minutes, being able to scale your Kafka clusters easily. Agree that this matters only if you're relying on Kubernetes, but that's not the only way to use Kafka. If you want to use Kafka in other ways, you can use the Confluent platform. This program is available in early access, soon to go generally available. So if you'd like to sign up, you can follow that link, confluent.io slash Kubernetes. And that's uh, you know, all I had here. Uh, if you'd like to you, you know, learn more about how Spring and Kafka work together, you can go to Victor Gamow's talk uh, later today. Thank you very much.